Hey, what's up, everybody? Today, I have the pleasure to chat with Canadian sportscaster, host of TSN Hockey, author, host of the Rubber Boots podcast, and Children Believe charity ambassador, James Duffy. In this newest episode, James talked about his experience studying journalism at Carleton University, first radio gig at Carleton Station, CKCU, following into Dune TV, early days in news, most important lesson he has learned in his career, toughest interview he's done, who cracks him up the most on the TSN Hockey panel, Jeff O'Neill's iconic jaw drop moment importance of having curiosity whether he feels happy where his career is today toronto maple leafs and more now with that being said hope you enjoy my conversation with james james hello jigme uh pleasure to be here thanks for having me i mean thank you for for taking the time to chat with me today it's it's a real pleasure to chat with an icon as they would say <laughs> well thank you i appreciate that uh I'm not sure about that, but I appreciate it. Uh, if you hear weird noises in the background, I always have to warn people. My permanent uh, podcast sidekick is my dog, uh, Willow, who's a disabled French bulldog. She can't walk very well. And uh, she usually grunts or snores or uh, you hear crazy licking sounds throughout the podcast. So I just don't want people to think I'm really strange if they don't see her. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I, I, I think I think the old dog is going to get jealous of that for sure. <laughs> for sure um yeah because i had i had on um so many people from sports i had on um uh dave poolin and uh poolin on the podcast i had um i mean who else did i have when i first started when i first started doing podcasts i did it at high school hmm. and there was this just storage room that wasn't being used it was just full of clutter and junk and so what they what we all did was we just helped stay overnight at like eight o'clock at night. Um, we cleaned out the whole thing and we just started renting equipment from Long and McQuaid. And we started making this really cool, just studio inside of that. And it's the studio is inside of a classroom and it's just this one huge room and it's soundproof, which is perfect for our podcasts and interviews. Um, and so I started my interviewing style and my interviewing experience when I, talked with um, this Tibetan politician because she just got elected, uh, freshly elected, right new. Um, and I remember just sending her a, a text on Instagram. I said, hi, I'm, I'm this and this. I'm interested in talking to you about this and this. Um, would you be willing to come on for a chat? Um, and in the same day, she said, yeah, I'll, I, I'm for sure doing this podcast. And I didn't know this, but she was actually, that was her first interview since being elected. Uh, she hasn't been a first of interviews anywhere else outside of Queens Park, but but she says that that was the first ever interview she's done since being elected, which was really cool for my first time and my first ever episode. Do you remember what your first episode was when, or your first interview was? Oh, geez. The first one that I did as an interviewer, like yourself, you mean? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to think in, like in high school, I didn't do any high school radio or anything like that. I didn't even do, you know, play by play for high school games. I still wanted to be an athlete at that time and was delusional. So I probably did play by play at home in my living room, you know, by myself, turning down the volume on hockey games and football games and so on. But it probably wasn't until university that I started to actually do interviews and I do remember my very first TV interview, I was at Carleton, I took journalism, was with the running back of the football team. Uh, his name was Mark Brown, way back when, I'm an old guy. But uh, Mark was the star running back for the football team, and I was doing a story about him. And, you know, I had my own camera, you had one person crew, right? Your own camera, tripod, audio, everything. But I remember it was really cool. TSN had come to interview him as well because he was having a great season. He was one of the best players in Canadian college football. And they were there, big crew outside. And I showed up and I said, I'll, I'll wait for these guys. And he said, no, no, I told you I'd do you first. And uh, he made this TSN crew wait while he did a little Jimmy College interview. And I was always really impressed by that, that, you know, a kid like that could have easily said, get lost. I want to do the TSN interview. And he said, no, you, you go first because I... I you know I scheduled you for two o'clock and then for two fifteen or whatever it was. So uh, I always remember that was my first really good interview experience where a guy was ah what a what a kind guy to do that for me. For sure, and I remember I remember hearing this story about 
um, you having that football player's dream. And you kind of said that you were a typical failed athlete. Um, uh, but you, you actually started, yeah, you started in a Carlton, which was really cool to, to see as well. Um, how much of that kind of like influenced your career now? A lot, probably. Now, first of all, Carlton back then, they didn't have any sports programs. There's places now in Canada where you can learn to be a sports reporter, College of Sports Media. I think Ryerson, I even think Carlson probably, Carlton probably has a course in it. But there was none of that. So we learned to be hardcore news reporters at Carlton. Like I was learning journalism, you know, how to write, how to do an interview. And it was almost all news. I could dabble and do a little sports story here and there like that one. But for the most part, it was it was news that I did. And when you say, how did it shape me? I always say that I probably never would have gotten the TSN job years later had it not been uh, for not just Carlton, but for them teaching me how to to write. And I, I was a news reporter for several years, seven, eight years before I became a, a sports uh, host. And I, I really believe those years, I, I wouldn't have made it if I didn't have those years in news. And it's a complicated answer, but I do think that news, it teaches you how to write better. Um, and when you say we talk about writing, that doesn't mean writing for a print article necessarily, but writing for TV, how to tell a story, that kind of thing. And I, I really think my time in news really helped me with that. And you also get a different view of the world when you cover news. You, you know, you sort of see where sports is. And I, and I think if you, if, you, if you were to watch me on TV the last 20 years, I'd, I'd, I'd try to be professional without taking my job too seriously. And because I, I, I think all those years in news gave me perspective as to what sports is supposed to be. And in my mind, it's supposed to be an escape from all the crap that's going on in the world. And so I try to treat it that way. You know, serious people take it seriously and that's all fine. But just remember, it's not life or death and uh and that's kind of the way i've tried to angle my the way i approach sports my entire career yeah and um i remember watching your interview and, and really listening to your conversation with sheila walsh of uh, radio humber <clears throat> where which is where i graduated from um at humber college north campus doing broadcasting radio diploma program um mm -hmm. and in that interview i i really kind of took some notes about what you said about it wasn't so that you were you weren't drawn to radio um you just said that you just happened to fall into rate uh doing broadcasting or uh stuff like that and it, you kind of just happened to fall into doing carlton radio i mean it was something that um you had early on as well i mean was i mean looking back now at your career in broadcasting where it stands today um, do you ever regret not going back to doing radio or do you, do you, do you feel happy doing broadcasting now? Yeah, I think I, I picked the right thing for me in the end. You know, there's a couple of things there. I, I remember in Carlton, I believe you had a choice which to focus on in the later years, third or fourth year, you could focus on TV or print or radio. And I had to make a decision there. And the decision I made was based on pure laziness. I said, okay, in, if there's the same story in, in print, you could write 2000 word story and radio, you could do like a five minute radio doc and in TV you only had to do like a minute and a half TV story. And so that seemed like the easiest one to do when in reality you find out in television, it's harder to leave stuff out. Uh, so in some ways it's harder to write for television than the others. So, uh, but that's probably why I did it. I just, I remember I did one project that I got a really good grade on in the, the teacher wrote, you, you should think about doing television for a career. And that's the first time I think I ever really, really thought about it. So I enjoy, I enjoy radio. I, I enjoy podcasting, which I think is kind of the new radio, no offense to radio. I, I really do because in my job on a night to night basis, Jigme, you know, I talk for 15 seconds at a time and then give it to the analysts. And, and in, in a podcast, you can actually sit and have a conversation like this and, and talk a lot more, which I like that element of it. But I don't regret any decision I made. Absolutely, and um, and 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 you you said that um, you know it, obviously I want to go back to what you said about it, it wasn't that I wasn't drawn to radio. It just happened I happened to fall into TV, 
And I, and you said radio was my first gig at CKCU, which is a Carlton radio station. Um, and you kind of said that, I remember it, I found this funny because you says that also the reason why you didn't want to do radio was because of the early morning hours that you would have to get up and do the newscast at like 5.30 in the morning. Um, oh my gosh, do I remember um, getting up at 5.30, leaving my home at 5.30 or 6 o'clock to go to to go to the campus and and get everything prepared to do to do a newscast it's it's a hard effort to do it's it's a lot of work to to force somebody actually to push somebody to do a newscast in 5 minutes and and they they tell you come one or two hours before your newscast before you record your newscast because everything drops beforehand so mm-hmm. make sure make sure you're also preparing yourself for enough time to finish that newscast because mm-hmm. if you come in an hour of before the newscast airs you're not going to have much time and you're going to be caught and you're off the air and it's all dead air um so i mean that's that's a huge thing i've learned through my college years of of being prepared being on time and and really showing professionalism as well i mean what was the what was the biggest lesson you've learned in your career so far Whoa, that's a that's a big question. I don't know. This is a lesson that I learned from my career as much as a life lesson that probably my parents instilled in me. But I think it applies to whatever job you're in and particularly our jobs is to just be kind to people and treat people well. And, you know, particularly in television, I think where if you're the face that's on the camera, you know, you've seen guys, there's all those YouTube videos of people treating uh, the anchors, treating the camera people horribly or yelling and screaming at them and producers and so on and so forth. And uh, I think you need to realize very early in the process that you are, uh, that everybody working on a show is equally important. The person in audio, the person in the control room, um, you know, the people behind the cameras, every single person is. And I think sometimes this business can warp your mind that you know you're the face on camera so you you somehow feel more important than anybody else and so i think that would probably be the you know the number one lesson or uh i don't like again i'm not sure i learned it i think that applies to all all facets of life or any workplace but i think that's that's a critical thing is to treat people well and then you know they'll want you to succeed you want them to succeed and uh and you're working as a team and you know, at TSN, I feel that way, right? You feel like it's, you know, we're not a sports team, but you kind of feel that way. You know, you do a good broadcast and everybody, you know, feels really good about it. If the show goes well, everybody feels bad if the show goes poorly. And uh, uh, I really like that aspect of it. Absolutely. And um, um, can you talk about your, your career in news? Because I know that doing research about you, you spent your first five years of your career doing news. And you said that I think news is invaluable. Now, I understand the desire to go to straight to sports. That's all I wanted to do when I was in school. But back then, there wasn't a lot of sports jobs. That's why I ended up with the job in news. Looking back now, what I think I found is to make uh, it makes you a much better broadcaster and also a much more rounded person. Um, can you talk about how sort of that news career that you had um, mm-hmm. in the earlier years of your career sort of helped ground you to where you are today yeah i mean i touched on a little bit of it about the perspective in the world that i i learned from news but i think what you're asking me there is it helped me become a a better broadcaster because and it goes back to the writing in in sports for instance let's just say let's just talk about being a reporter so if you're a sports reporter it's kind of easy in a way if you're covering what what city are you in are you in toronto or are you in I'm in Toronto. Yeah. So, so you're covering the Leafs, right? You go down to practice. The players skate around the ice. You take your your cameraman takes pictures of them. They bring out the players you want to interview. You interview them. You go home. You put together a nice little story, right? Uh, in news, you really have to work a lot harder. Uh, the the news it, the story is not right there for you. You have to go find the visuals. If it's, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. You're doing a story. You have to cover a boring city council meeting, and they're uh, they're talking about some sort of change where they're going to uh, put in a new 
I'm trying to, I'm thinking of a really local story. They're going to put in a new stoplight at some intersection and it's controversial and you have to figure out how you're going to tell the story and get people from both sides. And maybe people don't want to talk to you. Maybe they do want to talk to you. You have to figure out how the visuals are going to work. It's just a lot more complicated and it makes you think a lot more. And also the job was different every single day. One day I could be at a double murder and the next day I could be at some county fair, you know, a cow milking contest or something. Uh, And so I really like the aspect of every day you came in and you did something different. And I think that in the end helped me become a a better writer, put me in way more different situations. I told a lot of different kinds of stories and I think it made me a better storyteller probably. So when I got to sports, uh, I was able to, I guess, bring some of those elements to it. Now in the end, I, the, the, the negativity of news really got to me. And that's why I had to leave and go to sports because I, I couldn't handle, I, I just couldn't handle the, the tragic stories. There was far too many and news kind of thrives on negativity. And that's not a criticism of anybody. That's just the way it is. If anybody watches or listens to the local news, that's just kind of the way it is. That's what makes the headlines. And I remember there was a, I was a high school football player and, there was a story in Ottawa where uh, a couple of high school football players had died uh, in a traffic accident. And I had to go to one of the places to houses to knock on the, the mother's door to get a picture. And I felt so awful uh, doing that. And she was great and, and fine and everything. And, but I, I walked away from that house saying, I can't do this anymore. I just, I can't, I can't deal with that. I'm too positive a person in my life to deal with negativity every day. And, and so I was, you know, able to get the sports job, I think maybe a year after that or something. And uh, sports can be negative too, but in general, it's a happier place. Right. And uh, so I needed that personally for my life. I have a ton of respect for news reporters, but it just wasn't for me. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it, I, like I, I, I want to echo your message of, of having like to chase interviews and, and find the visuals because that's what you also talked about in the interview uh, with um, uh, Sheila Walsh. And you also mentioned that what you're just saying about having to go get the interviews because nothing is in front of you. Um, rather, well, whereas in sports, it's easy because you can go to the rink, the visuals are in front of you um, and the players are brought to you. You don't have to go to them um, and everything is there for you. Whereas in news, you would have to book the interviews. You would have to contact this person. You have to contact the chief deputy officer. You have to contact the deputy mayor's office. And you have to ask them about what's going to happen with uh, this and this. What's going to happen with the budget? What's going to happen with everything else? Right. Um, and I think that like in my experience at Humber, I also had that opportunity where I was kind of like freaking out because I didn't have an interview um, at a certain deadline. Um, and so what I did was what I learned from one of the professors was in your email, in the subject line, say interview request for Radio Humber urgent, put it all in caps with the exclamation marks, because then somebody knows that he needs this now. Um, he cannot wait. There is no, there's no waiting because the show has to go on. Um, and so once I did that, I started getting interviews from different people and I end up, I ended up interviewing a lot of people. I end up interviewing Francois Clark, who's been nominated, I think, for a Juno, um, and Lindsay L, who's been a country artist that's won countless awards as well. Um, I've done so many people, um, and it's really helped this podcast because um, I can go chase different interviews, but I'm not guaranteed to get them. Um, I remember when I was uh, at, uh, I think, high school. I did my earliest interviews were the politician that ended up doing Steve Dangle um, that I had to do. Um, uh, I was just so fortunate to talk to Bill Daly, um, the deputy commissioner. Um, and I, I was really picking his brain about, um, about the Maple Leafs. And I was saying, do you know anything about that? There's any trades in, in, in the works that you know of. And he says that, and he's, and, and he couldn't, he kind of joked with me and he said, maybe I think you should stick with Elliot Friedman. Cause he's like, we kind of get shocked at some points of how fast they get it before we even have it. Um, right. So he says, stick to your insider uh, contacts. They're, they're, they're more quicker than we do. Um, 
but yeah. I, I mean, was the uh, on the panel that you guys have, which is uh, Cheryl Pounder, Dave Poulin, and it switches from time to time. There's then the O Dog. Um, who cracks you up the most? Oh, that that would have to be the O Dog, and they all do to an extent. Everybody has different senses of humor. Dave's actually you probably found out he's he's quietly very wryly funny. And he's often sitting next to me. Cheryl's very funny and a fantastic time. I, I, I got to know her a lot at the World Juniors in, in Halifax because you spend pretty much every day together for a couple of weeks, and she's a ton of fun. But O-Dog is just a one-of-a-kind uh, guy. Darren Dreger is really funny, too. Uh, but O-Dog, you know, he just has so many stories from his career that are – he's very self-deprecating and uh, – He's, he just, I don't know, he's just a one-of-a-kind character, and we need more of those in hockey. For sure, and I, I had the chance to interview CJ and uh, Dregs as well, which is uh, really cool, too. Um, th- I mean, they're all funny. I mean, the O-Dog is hilarious, I will say. Um, when But when, when O-Dog is livid about something, that's when he's the most hilarious. Um, when, yeah. he blows up, when he blows up about something, when a big save happens in the game, I remember seeing this video of him uh, reacting to a save from a goaltender, um, and his jaw and his jaw dropped. Um, that was a freaky moment, though. Like that was a that was a one in a million moment because just for your listeners, they we sit at the we sit at the uh, a desk watching the game. Right, we're only on in the intermissions, and somewhere in the, one of the control rooms or the truck that's doing the game. There's a person who you call a switcher or a technical director who hits the buttons to decide which camera gets shown. And somebody hit the wrong button and happened to hit the studio button. And it happened to be the camera that O-Dog was on. And O-Dog happened to be making that face right after a save. That's never never happened before that they've hit the wrong button and they've cut to the studio in the middle of action. Never. And it happened to be that moment with O's, with that crazy save. I think it was Freddie Anderson and... Uh, O's face and so that's one of my favorite moments that we've had happen in the panel and all the many years we've been doing it absolutely and um so with that being said I I I know I know that like a lot of the interviews uh you got asked about mostly about your career and stuff like that but on this podcast I do ask people about their careers but I really like to take it a different angle I, I like to have fun with it I, I don't ever I want to do something different I want to give that interviewer uh the interviewee um uh, just a different angle of an interview not just about their career but asking them about different things that are challenging um and so i want to go into more of a i guess controversial or so topic about the toronto maple leafs um i mean they are controversial um for sure um so they've all they've obviously made a lot of trades that have shocked the world and um they had a lot of deals that they were that, that they were working on, and they landed Ryan O'Reilly, Nola Chari, um, mm-hmm. and a lot of those deals were substantial. Um, they were, and and they look effective so far. With but O'Reilly's out, but he's ex- he's expected to make a return soon for the playoffs. Um, but was there any trades that the Leafs have done that kind of shocked you and said that? Hmm, this could be an interesting type trade and could maybe be the deciding factor or the X factor in the playoffs. No, I mean, I don't think you can look at any of those trades and say they were shocking, right? There, I mean, the biggest trade was obviously the O'Reilly trade. And uh, that was the eye-opening trade because they went out and early and got two very useful guys. Um, I mean, the rest are all little bit pieces. And I don't think that, you know, maybe at the end of this, maybe a couple of defensemen will get hurt and, and Gustafson will come in and play a significant role on the power play in the playoffs, right? Or Luke Shen will be a regular guy in the top six and, you know, his physicality will really help them get past Tampa. None of these things we know right now until after the playoffs. But I think that every trade in this case were purely, lo- you know, they all made sense, right? They were logical deals for pieces and depth pieces that they needed. So whether one of those puts them over the top, I mean, I would s- s- highly suspect if, if one does in the end, it'll be the O'Reilly Achari deal that does it. But uh, I, I think they were all, again, it's hard to, tra- trades are funny. It's hard to judge them because you can say, oh, this guy's the, we always declare winners and losers on trade deadline day and 
everybody says, oh, this GM did great and this GM did awful. But until the playoffs are done, and sometimes it's years down the road if you get a young player, you can't make that you can't make that judgment. And the other thing is, even if the Leafs were to lose in the first round, that doesn't mean that Kyle Dubas blew it with those trades necessarily, right? I think some of the trades he's made in past years were were the right guys. It's just you know it didn't work out for whatever reason. Other aspects of the team failed. So you know O'Reilly, Ochari, Luke Shen. These guys could all play well come playoff time and and Jake McCabe and so on and so forth, but they could still lose, right? And the fault may be otherwise. The fault might be the goalie or maybe Matthews and Marner don't have a good series. So uh, that's the funky thing about, about trade. So would, you know, would Kyle Dubas be fired or people calling for him to be fired if they lose in the first round again, probably, but it doesn't necessarily mean the, the moves were wrong. Absolutely. Um, and, and the trades that they made were, um, I think, I think one of the trades that I thought was eye opening was the Sandine trade. Um, I thought that was interesting to me because Sandine looked like he looked like he did have a spot in that top six, but or the bottom six of the the pairings, I guess. Um, but it just didn't look like. I I don't, I don't know what went through Kyle Dubas's head or. or... They decided he wasn't he didn't he wasn't a playoff player, as in he wasn't what they needed. If you look at the Leafs' failures in the past, that he couldn't play the physical playoff style hockey that they thought this particular team needed. That doesn't mean that Rasmus Sandin isn't going to be effective uh, as a playoff player down the road. Maybe he will be. But for what the Leafs needed for a depth defense, when he wasn't going to play in the top pairing or anything, or that that wasn't what the fit was, that they wanted more of a, you know, a Luke Shen type who had playoff experience and had been in those battles before. So I think it was as simple as that. And, you know, if Sandine does well somewhere else, awesome. But I think they looked at their team and said, this guy's not the type of demand that we need to beat Tampa and Boston and, and you know, get out of the uh, division. Absolutely. And um, um, as we're wrapping up here, I want to um, really um, ask you, do you, when you look at the series now, because we know Toronto is going to face Tampa in the first round, like we know that it's a lock already. Um, mm-hmm. But the only thing we don't know is whether it's going to be at Scotiabank Arena or not for the home ice. Um, but do you think that this is a series that Toronto can win this year? Absolutely. I mean, it was a series Toronto could have won last year and should have won last year. Uh, Toronto should be the favorite in the series. They've had a better season than Tampa. They're going to get second, I think, in all likelihood, barring some sort of collapse down the stretch. They just have to do a little better job taking advantage of, of home ice. So, I, I look... I don't know if they're going to win. Uh, it's still going to be kind of a bit of a toss-up series, but at some point, I think at some point your stars get tired of losing and and they decide to make a difference. Now Vasilevsky could stand on his head and Samsonov and or Murray, I suppose, could could have a bad series and it won't matter anyway. But uh, can they win? Absolutely. Should they win? Probably. Will they win? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, and so uh, I want to ask you about um, um, your your I guess your interviewing style because there's a lot of people that I look up to in interviewers. Um, I I really like to watch and listen to Barbara Walters and Larry King, and I like to really take notes about what they're doing and how they're asking questions to people and their guests. Um, and I, I was taking some notes yesterday about Barbara Walters because I was listening to her interview with Oprah, um, her masterclass podcast. And something that stuck out to me was Barbara Walters said, um, in order to be a good journalist, um, you have to have curiosity. If you have no curiosity, you're not going to make it. Um, do you feel that's relevant with your career and where it's at now? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. If you're, if you're just going through the motions, what's the point of it? The only other, I don't pretend to be an expert interviewer or anything like that, but the to young interviewers, I would always say, or, you know, journalism students, whatever, like listening is the biggest thing. I, 
I can remember I was probably guilty back in school. You know, you're doing your early interviews and you make a list of questions here. I have questions one through 10 and you just sit there and, and go off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that usually doesn't end up being a good interview. What you, what you really need to do is have questions in your head that you want to ask, but let the interviewee, you know, lead you as far as which direction the discussion goes in. And maybe, oh, I was going to ask him question 10 later, but now's the more appropriate time because of just what he said. And usually the best questions in an interview are follow-up questions. The ones where he says something and, 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 and you think of something that you need to follow up on. And so that's, that's listening. I, I've seen many interviewers who just don't listen to what the person is saying uh, just in order to get through their questions. So uh, that's the, what I will do is often I'll write down a bunch of questions if I'm interviewing somebody and you know try to remember them and then i'll i will never look at that piece of paper because i'll you know want to listen to what the person is saying and maybe i'll only get to like three of the 20 questions that i've written down so sometimes you have to ask a lot more if the person's not too talkative but if you have a good subject it should just be a, it shouldn't look like an interview it should just look like a conversation right and that's 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 the best you know it's a good interview when it felt like a conversation for sure. And I felt like this was a conversation. Um, and, um, you know, like I think Barbara Walters, you know, just like she, she really hit it on the head. She said that it it's not the first question. It's the second. Um, when I have questions, um, I will ask the first question. Um, then when I get to my next question, I will rip it up and just go, go with the flow and have the curiosity and listen um, instead of having to go through that list of what you're saying about going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. Um, mm -hmm. and in a lot of interviews, when you're hearing people talk to different guests and they, they say, here's my first question, here's my second question, here's my third question, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth question, and here's my last question. Um, I think a lot of it now is I've at the beginning of like when I was doing this, I, I was doing that all along. Um, and then I started to really hone in on different people and in my inspirations of broadcasting and radio. And I started listening to their work and I said, I have to change this way um, because it's not going to work that way if, if I want to go far in this industry. Um, and so with, with that being said, who was the toughest person you've interviewed? Ooh. The toughest person I've interviewed. I don't know, Jimmy, if I have an answer for that, because I mean, I've been fortunate. I haven't had any unless I go way, way. I'm sure back in my news days, I had people that told me to get lost and left after a question or two. But, it, you know, in sports, for the most part, when I do an interview, it's an arranged interview where it's been talked about beforehand. If I'm going to interview, let's say, you know, Sidney Crosby or something like that, he's agreed to do the interview. It's been set up through his PR department. And uh, so he's. It's not going to be, you know, and he's an experienced guy and we're only doing the interview because we know it'll be a decent interview. Uh, I haven't had too many contentious situations. Occasionally on the air, I had a couple of general managers that I won't name because there's no point in that didn't necessarily uh, uh, like the subjects of my questions or something like that. I'm sure we've all had moments like that in hockey, but for the most part, I've, it's been decent. Um I can't think of one where I walked out and said, oh, that was a horrible experience. So I'm lucky that way. For sure. Well, it's the end of our time together, but thank you so much for chatting with me, James. I just had such a pleasure and it's been an honor to talk with you. Um, to the listeners who made it this far into the episode, thanks so much for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with the award-winning Canadian sportscaster, host of TSN Hockey, author, host of the Rubber Boots podcast, and Children Believe Charity Ambassador, James Duffy. Um, you can find him on Instagram, Twitter, and on TikTok. To help support my show, please feel free to share with family, friends, or on social media. You can also find my podcast on all streaming platforms. I've been your host, Jimmy Keltzing. Thanks for tuning into the show.